Welcome to the Fright Lab. I'm Lucas Yoakum. And with me tonight is someone who will wait a little while. See what happens. Joseph Wren. Joe, are you as excited to talk about these movies as I am? I have crawled out of the pit, and I have seen things that should not be seen by the living. Nonetheless, I am excited to talk about all things John Carpenter, but tonight we're talking about the Apocalypse Trilogy, and good evening to you, all of you gruesome people. If this is the first time you've listened to the Fright Lab, welcome. You picked a good episode. Maybe I say that every time we do an episode, but I really do think this one is going to be Chef's Kiss, because John Carpenter, ladies and gentlemen, did you know, Lucas, that John Carpenter makes actual films? <laughs> I believe I'm going to comment on that somewhere in the 3,000 plus words I've written about this subject, Joe. Oh, good God. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Uh, You know me. Once I start talking, I don't shut up, right? That's what we pay you for. Well, that's why I'm here. So I'm willing to wager that the overwhelming majority of our audience are fans of John Carpenter. It almost is held as gospel truth that John Carpenter is one of the best horror creators and directors of the last 100 years. And in my opinion, Carpenter is one of the best film directors in American history, full stop. Since 1974, John Carpenter has been dropping gem after gem into our consciousness in the form of horror, action, and sci-fi films. And this says nothing of his prolific work as a musician, composing themes for his own movies, as well as soundtracks for a handful of other filmmakers. Is that not enough for you? How about his work on the anthology film Body Bags and his absolutely crushing entry into the Master of Horrors series, an episode called Cigarette Burns? We're going to be talking about that in an upcoming episode, so keep that in mind for later. And I think that is a good place to end my short summary of his career. John Carpenter is, to steal a phrase, a legitimate master of horror. Gotta know, Joe, do you have a favorite John Carpenter film? I have a hard time putting down one film as the ultimate John Carpenter experience. My favorite film, full stop, is two films. It's Escape from New York and Escape from L.A. Interesting. But if I have to Hmm. pull the grenade on John Carpenter, we all know that Halloween is at least started with John Carpenter. Oh, sure. It's an an absolute classic. The anthology theme that he wanted to do went into Halloween 3. I'm sure we're going to talk about that film at some point. It is underrated for sure. But The Grenade, The Pin, what is the best John Carpenter film? Hands down, my friend. It is uh, Big Trouble in Little China. I'm a Big Trouble guy, too. Um, If I have to pick a favorite John Carpenter film, Big Trouble in Little China is my absolute favorite. I don't recall if I mentioned that at some point in the script. But but I've got to be honest, like picking that, is a hard one because so many of his films are just that good. The thing about John Carpenter that I like to point out is he's a real filmmaker. He doesn't have any modern dispositions about, I want to put this on the screen and this is how much budget I need to have that created with a computer. He, no, he he just sets up the camera and shoots. And if there's flaws, guess what, guys? It's a real movie. It's a real thing that happened. He's one of the kings of practical. Hmm, yeah, okay. Because the I will first agree thing with that. somebody's going to say is, Joe, you just said you like Escape from New York. There was this giant CGI surfing scene. No, that was that, a green screen. That's that was, different. And that was Escape from LA. Thank you so much for correcting me there, Lucas. <laughs> I've, I've, I may have watched Big Trouble in Little China as recently as two days ago because it is one of the films that sits on the, I'm going to call it the quick access Blu ray DVD <laughs> shelf in my living room. Like, you got to have like five or six at the ready if 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 the mood catches you or your crowd. And I think Big Trouble is absolutely hands down. What is Carpenter? It's that. Ah, you know, one of these days we're going to have to do an episode about what is your desert island quick grab five movies. You can only watch these for the rest of history. I'm looking forward to that. that that's an interesting question. That's a, that's a fun one. And whatever you might pick as your favorite John Carpenter movie, it's hard to argue that his best known and maybe best loved film is his iteration of The Thing, released in 1982. Now, sure, everyone loves Halloween, but let's get real for just a split second. The Thing might be his magnum opus, 
based on the 1951 The Thing from Another World. It's a remake, sort of, but it is very much his own movie. We'll talk about the plot of The Thing briefly. So what I will say here is that this one is maybe the most obviously loved in his canon outside of Halloween. Uh, Let me explain why, okay? From the cast, to the plot, to the setting, to the action, the thing feels kind of tailor-made for being a genre film classic. I don't know if he knew that at the time of direction, at the time he sat down to create the film, but he he nailed it. He nailed the formula going forward. All of that is well and good, sure, I'll grant. But what isn't discussed enough is that this movie is the beginning of a loose sort of a series, an unofficial batch of movies all tangentially related together, along with Prince of Darkness in 1987 and In the Mouth of Madness in 1994. We have what is known as the Apocalypse Trilogy. Normally, when we are talking about trilogies of films, you think of things like Star Wars, um, which, okay, yeah, we all think about that. Well, there's now three trilogies. Go figure. (laughs) Or you might think about the original Carpenter Halloween and the first three movies, which kind of don't really sync up because of Halloween 3. Again, long story, another subject for another day. You know, John Carpenter wasn't going to be the guy to repeat himself too terribly much. Instead of simply being The Thing 2 or whatever, the Apocalypse Trilogy feels completely disconnected at first. As the unofficial title implies, the Apocalypse Trilogy is about the possibility of our world, as we know it today, coming to a brutal end. As Tom Waits once sang, the Earth would die screaming, or... At least the inhabitants of the Earth would, anyway. But what is never discussed is how these movies are connected beyond a singular plot element. I'm of the opinion that this movie is dealing with a singular particular element, a point which occurs in each of the movies of the trilogy, albeit in different ways. As I was preparing to write this episode, I had considered titling it, What is John Carpenter Afraid Of?, I decided against that title for a handful of reasons. To start, Carpenter flicks don't tend to have a lot in common with each other, really. And that's not to say that all of his movies are completely disconnected. For instance, John Carpenter loves working with certain actors. Maybe the most obvious of that is Kurt Russell and Keith David. Fuck. Yes. Solid choices, right? Uh, these Call two snake. <laughs> these two kind of seem uh, incapable of giving us a bad performance. And Carpenter doesn't seem to mind uh, remakes or maybe reinterpretations of films either. The Thing, Village of the Damned, and Memoirs of an Invisible Man are not exactly new plots or new concepts. Finally, John Carpenter clearly loves being a musician maybe even more than he likes making movies. And that's actually kind of a good thing. Carpenter scores are nearly universally fantastic and memorable. And finally, the reason why I didn't go with that original title, What is John Carpenter Afraid Of?, is like, you know, all of us share an objective universe, but you can never really know what's going on inside someone else's head. So not only do I I think that it's, wrong in terms of the media he's created. I just think it's factually wrong and I don't want to be presumptuous. And of course, Mr. Carpenter, John, can I call you John? If you hear this and you want to talk about what you're afraid of, I would kill to have that conversation. Absolutely. (laughs) You can reach us. You can reach us at the fright lab podcast at gmail.com. We would be absolutely delighted to have you on the show. If someone in the audience knows John Carpenter, do us this solid just this once he's also one of my favorite examples of a do-it-yourself kind of guy you've talked about the different pieces of the film making process and how yes he he does his own film scores he enjoys being a musician but he puts his hands on every aspect of the film in a way i was first introduced to by say robert rodriguez and just knowing that Every little piece of this film 
as perfect or imperfect as you could call it, it all works together. Like no, there's nothing beautiful about his 80s film scores. But the fact that they just sound John Carpenter, the theme from Escape from New York is iconic to me. Big Trouble in Little China, iconic. Oh, sure. The Halloween theme? I mean, legendary. Fucking iconic. <laughs> it, it's a rare thing, I think. A lot of directors now uh, don't have the ability or don't have the time, I think, to be that uh, deep in the process, I guess. It, it's He knows what he's doing, and while he is largely retired from filmmaking, and that's you know another conversation for another day, you can't argue that he made his point. So with all of that said, uh, we have to talk about the plots of the three movies. There will be some minor spoilers ahead in this episode, but I have to imagine that most of our audience is already hip to the Carpenter thing. And if you haven't seen uh, these three movies, you really, really should. The Thing is is practically essential viewing for modern horror cinema. But Prince of Darkness and In the Mouth of Madness are also really, really good on their own. And I don't think they get near enough attention. So after we discuss the plots of these movies, I want to dig into what I think is the somewhat hidden theme of these films. It's a concept I have not seen in any horror commentary going forward. So... Let's go. Let's see what happens. Twelve men have just discovered something. For 100,000 years, it was buried in the snow and ice. Now it has found a place to live. Inside. Where no one can see it. Or hear it. Or feel it. I know I'm human. Some of you are still human. This thing doesn't want to show itself. It wants to hide inside an imitation. It'll fight if it has to, but it's vulnerable out in the open. If it takes us over, then it has no more enemies. Nobody left to kill it. And then it's one. You guys gonna listen to Gary? He can beat one of those things! Man, it, even the trailer is good. Wow, God, I haven't watched that before. That's killer. Absolutely. I'm telling you, it's up there in my brain with the remake of Body Snatchers in the 80s. All right, so The Thing, now that we're done gushing, for now. The Thing was released, as I said earlier, in 1982, and it follows the final days of an American research station in the Antarctic. A Norwegian chopper is chasing an unusual dog across the tundra in a barely unpleasant series of accidents, the Norwegian crew is killed and the dog manages to temporarily ingratiate itself with the American crew and quickly reveals its true nature. So, uh, real quick, one last warning. Spoilers for The Thing and the rest of the Apocalypse trilogy going forward. If you haven't seen them by now, you have been warned. But trust me, go back and watch them. Okay, so the dog that's been chased by uh, the Norwegians into the arms of the Americans is not, in fact, a dog. It's an advanced extraterrestrial parasite creature. This monster, the titular thing, is attempting to assimilate life forms into itself so it can imitate them almost flawlessly. This sort of camouflage makes it a near-perfect predator. It uses trusted faces and names and identities within communities to strike suddenly and mercilessly, rapidly absorbing, then decimating the people around it. It doesn't take long for the crew of the station, after a handful of terrifying encounters, to realize the stakes. The speed at which the thing can search and destroy makes it more than a mere monster. This is a potentially civilization-ending threat. So the station's crew isolate and then hunker down attempting to track the monster and kill it. But here's the problem. In this environment, where a vicious predator could be masquerading as your favorite coworker, who can you trust? I'm not going to lie. That premise always gives me the chills. 
It's a classic horror trope, and it plays with some really neat concepts. But I have to imagine that in lesser hands, the thing would have been a ridiculous snooze fest. I think that paranoia is a hard emotion to either experience or explain. The inability to trust, to know what's what, is absolutely brutal. But it's also abstract, right? I feel like these classic horror films, because that's what this is. Yes, it's a remake from one of my favorite directors of all time, and it stands on its own. It's a different film than the thing that came from, what was it, another... <laughs> the thing from another world. The thing from another world. I'm sorry. I've, I'm, my brain is somewhere else this week. Um, it's, it's a different film. That one was more about the people, right? That's like 12 angry men, but different meetings. Like, okay, so we move from point A to point B. This thing happened. That's more about the dialogue. This is about the fear. It's about the tension and the way they used tension and body horror in this film has not been matched, at least not to the same horrific degree. Yes, body horror is horrifying, but something about the tension of a Carpenter film, they're in the Antarctic, not the Arctic. You're at the South Pole, my friend. It's cold down there, and a few other horror films would put some things down there that make me more terrified for Kurt Russell in this film. <laughs> but think about the 80s films, the 80s horror films that you remember, the real body horror B-movie, if you want to call it that, or straight-to-video thing. Um, but then you have remakes of other films like The Blob, where I'm convinced... That remake was trying to do a Carpenter thing without actually involving John Carpenter. Maybe. Um, I my brain has always said that the blob is the ultimate result of the thing. Maybe. Uh, maybe that's the case. I, I don't know that I can comment on it uh, fully, but I will say that the, the 80s remake of the blob is a blast. It is a lot of fun. Or even Body Snatchers. Oh, the, the 19... Was it 75? Something remake like of Body that. Snatchers with um, uh, Donald Sutherland. It's unreal. It's so good. Um, if you've never seen either of those, by all means, add them to your list. Uh, one last thing before we move on to the next film. There is, in fact, a prequel to The Thing. Uh, it was released in 2011, and it's very cleverly titled The Thing. That's not clever at all, Lucas. <laughs> the 2011 prequel gets a bad rap, but I think it's kind of lovingly done, and it has some fun scares and plot elements in it. It takes place just days before the events of Carpenter's outing, showing the events at the Norwegian station, how things went belly up, you might say. It's not essential viewing by any stretch, but it is a lot of fun. Uh, furthermore, it's kind of one of the few latter-day prequel sequels from that era of films that I really enjoy. So, yeah, if, if you've got a chance, go check that one out. Anyone in close proximity has the same dream. What is it? A secret that can no longer be kept. It started a month ago. What started? A change in the earth and the sky. His power. There's a weird locking mechanism. It looks like it can only be opened from the inside. A life form is growing out of prebiotic fluid. It's not winding down into disorder. It's self-organizing. It's becoming something. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I'm serious, man. The Carpenter beat exists in my brain. It it's it's an actual thing. All right. So, it's finally time to talk about one of my favorite horror movies, Prince of Darkness from 1987. Of the three entries in the Apocalypse trilogy, Prince of Darkness might be the most unusual and therefore the least loved. It certainly has a fan base. But you just don't hear people singing its praises enough, so maybe tonight we can change that. Prince of Darkness follows what appears to be two disparate threads colliding. 
the aftermath of a secret held by a local church relating to a maybe shadowy organization called the Brotherhood of Sleep. Its final member has died and left his secrets to another priest, played by the utterly inimitable Donald Pleasance. Rest in peace, sir. Oh, man, what a, what a loss. What an incredible actor. So Pleasance, playing our priest, begins investigating his dead colleague's story and discovers something dark, something ancient in the basement of a crumbling church. Here's where that second thread appears. He decides that he needs the help of a professor, Howard Birach, an expert on the cutting edge of physics. Our introduction to Professor Barak and his class of young students starts with one of the best monologues in horror movie history. And everyone, fans, friends, I have to apologize as I have wanted to read this monologue in some context for a long time. Joe, if you'll permit me. Let's talk about our beliefs and what we can learn from them. We believe nature is solid and time a constant. Matter has substance and time a direction. There is truth in flesh and in solid ground. The wind may be invisible, but it's real. Smoke, fire, water, light. They're different. Not as to stone or steel, but they're tangible. And we assume time is narrow because it is a clock. One second is one second for everyone. Cause precedes effect. Fruit rots, water flows downstream. We are born, we age, we die. The reverse never happens. None of this is true. Say goodbye to classical reality because our logic collapses on the subatomic level into ghosts and shadows. Beautiful, scary, and decidedly carpenter, right? Well done, sir. I, I will accept my Oscar as well as my hefty financial reward. Uh, by the way, Professor Birok is played by the equally inimitable Victor Wong. Really, the whole cast here is kind of spectacular. Uh, Dennis Dunn, Lisa Blunt, Peter Jason, a massive part of this cast are just Carpenter regulars. And this movie features a great cameo from rock and roll icon Alice Cooper, which is, you know, it's, it's just fun. Always welcome. Always. Back to the plot. Professor Birok, his students and his colleagues, and our yet unnamed priest take on the ominous task of identifying and managing this ancient evil. And as it always goes with the Fright Lab, things go very badly. <laughs> this ancient evil has escaped its bonds and is attempting to unmake man's sovereignty over his reality. The ancient evil within the church is slowly but surely possessing the entirety of Professor Birok's team. And if it manages to fully escape from its containment, it's game over for all of us. Prince of Darkness is a heavy, weird movie, even by the standards of John Carpenter, a man known for heavy, weird movies. I think the plot, playing with the supposed intersection of quantum physics and religion, would have played very differently in, say, I don't know, 2003 than it did in 1987. Prince of Darkness also came on the heels of Carpenter's 1984's Starman, which was extremely popular. But Starman couldn't be further from the plot of Prince of Darkness, you know what I mean? Being offbeat and sweet and refreshing. Three words we would never use to describe Prince of Darkness. It is offbeat, sure, but sweet? Mm, beg to differ. And while I love this movie... I can see how it has never played well with most mainstream audiences. It has picked up quite a cult following, and it really does merit your attention. If you've never seen Prince of Darkness, you absolutely need to watch it. I remember seeing this film the first time on television. I think it found some feet in syndication and your 11 p.m. horror movies on insert 
whatever channel locally for you would channel play those 11, movies. Channel 11, man. Channel 11. St. Louis, my friend. KPLR. Gotta love it to this day. And this one, I remember thinking, when I didn't fully understand what body horror was, I feel like this film gave me some insight. More from the... Just the use of those transitional effects or your your very practical use of liquid and smoke mm -hmm. to create something that your eye catches and it's crooked and it just doesn't make sense and it, you just feel uncomfortable when you're watching it. It has the same vibe as any B-horror 80s cassette tape that you <laughs> rented from insert name of store. It, it brings you to that place and I think that's something that I love about Carpenter. What you're going to get isn't necessarily the big screen feel. But if somebody decides to give it the big screen budget, yeah, it might look better, but he didn't make a different movie here. This this is the same film, his style, that you saw in, say, 78 with Halloween. I think the thing with Prince of Darkness is that it is so offbeat and it is so odd by the rest of his standards and it's bleak like the movie never lets you feel good once like again i'm a big trouble in little china guy i absolutely adore that film it is a genuinely funny movie dennis dunn and kurt russell together should have done way more movies they were they were absolutely 100 they were they they had great chemistry they're a lot of jones fun. and short round right there just make more movies with that <laughs> feel Right, exactly. I would kill to see these the, two guys together. The further adventures of of uh, of those two characters, man. Jack Burton, Th thank me. you. The adventures <laughs> of Jack Burton and uh, and Wong are just ah, oh, my God, so good. Or uh, Wong, Jesus Christ, am I showing my my absolute de degraded memory? Wang, I don't know why I didn't know that. You know, mess with Lo Wang, different Wang. Sorry. Right. But yeah, I, I think it's one of those movies where it does kind of feel like a B movie, but it feels like an incredibly high concept B movie. It, it's so, so out there. And I mean, look, man, you could let Donald Pleasance read the Chinese food menu from your local restaurant and it would sound with incredible gravitas. And I would still believe Mike Myers needs to die. <laughs> yeah. I, I, few the people dumplings can be fried <laughs> or steamed. <laughs> I never knew what true evil was until I was told I couldn't have the dumplings fried. Anyway, I don't know where I was going with the that joke. <laughs> okay, enough Donald Pleasance reading Chinese food. I shouldn't have started that. My point being that Prince of Darkness is just one of those movies where I understand why it's not popular. I do. It really is a weird watch. It doesn't ever make you feel good. But it's fun in a really gruesome way. It's fun in a way that horror movies uh, kind of aren't sometimes. And I, I miss that. I really do. Because it, while it is very dated, like, oh, man, the outfits the actors are wearing in those movies is very much from a time period. But I will say that it's also... I don't know that it could have been done any other time. And now everybody and their brother kind of has a, a vague idea about what quantum physics is or what quantum physics uh, physics are. Uh, back then, no, not so much, really. So, yeah, anyway, uh, Prince of Darkness, absolutely worth your attention. This one will drive you absolutely mad. The riots began because the stores could not meet the demands of Sutter Kane's novel, In the Mouth of Madness. Kane disappeared two months ago without a trace. Isn't the guy that writes horror books? You can forget about Stephen King. Kane outsells them all. I need to know if he's alive or dead, and I need that book. It's a setup. It's just a, I just have to work out how it's set up. Kane's writing has been known to have an effect on his readers. This it's a map. This whole thing has been staged. You just get out. This is not reality. It's all happening for real, Trent. Next month. 
Damn. Ah, yes. It's been a while. I think you might have just put this on the on my list of uh, September. Let's get ready for Halloween films. I genuinely hope that this uh, episode of this show puts a lot of movies on people's. Let's watch this now. Be that October or be that tomorrow. I I don't know if I ever accomplish anything with this show, Joe, and that is getting people to go. That movie sounds cool. I should check that out. Or conversely. Man, I haven't seen In the Mouth of Madness in years. I need to give that a rewatch. The final entry in the Apocalypse trilogy is In the Mouth of Madness, released in 1994. This film follows Carpenter alum Sam Neill as John Trent, an insurance investigator and a bit of a cutthroat cynic. Trent has been hired by a publishing company to track down its top-grossing horror author, Sutter Kane. Oh, that's a name. It's a great name for a horror author, man. He's gone missing, and he owes his publisher a new novel, the titular In the Mouth of Madness. Kane is more popular than Stephen King, but his work is beginning to do something new and something deeply scary. Sutter Kane's novels are doing more than just scaring fans. His novels are turning his fans into ravening monsters and turning his colleagues into axe-wielding murderers. Trent isn't convinced, though. So he and his publishing company rep, Linda Stiles, head to find Sutter Kane in New England. And when they do finally find him, they discover that Sutter Kane is not writing mind-blowingly horrific novels, no. Sutter Kane is the prophet of a powerful, unearthly force. They have been scratching at the walls of our reality for endless eons, and they are about to break through using Kane's writings. Anyone who comes in contact with Kane, or for that matter, his books, will inevitably become warped by his work, if not outright destroyed by it. Fans of horror literature are probably all thinking. Sutter Kane sounds like a stand-in for either Stephen King or H.P. Lovecraft. And you're absolutely correct. Carpenter films have been called Lovecraftian many times, and this movie is his most overtly Lovecraftian in basically his entire oeuvre. The script is loaded with lines used in Lovecraft novels. Go check it out online one day, it's neat. Uh, Kane's use of New England as a setting in all of his fictitious books, along with being an alleged New Englander himself, are based on the life and writing preferences of both H.P. Lovecraft and Stephen King. His name also has that horror vibe. Sutter Kane makes me think of Poltergeist. Mm. Right off the bat, and, and yes, we're talking about Poltergeist 2, where they introduce Kane as the evil face of the ghosts that were all trying to get Carol Ann the whole time, right? And then fast forward two or three sequels later. But it's just a good, scary name. I think there's something in in our being. If you have ever heard the story of Cain and Abel, there's something about the word Cain that just taps you on the shoulder and says, this is the bad guy. <laughs> and it works for that reason, but like you said, this movie's not just a simple, yeah, I wrote this book and now people are trying to kill each other. That would have been They Live. Eh, okay. <laughs> but this is, this person is evil and he's been around for a while and just influencing everything, trying to build to this ultimate crescendo of death and madness and absolute insanity. I mean, if somebody showed up at a window with an axe, Today, we think of The Purge. Sure. 1995? Why is that man standing there with an axe? And why does he just want to start killing people? I, you know, there is, I, I don't believe in uh, nominative determinism. That is to say, your name influences your fate. But, you know, John Wick is the name of an action hero, right? Like, irreducibly. If his name was Peter Schultz, you wouldn't take him seriously. No one would go see a movie just called Peter Schultz. But Sutter Kane? Oh, hell, that is a horror villain name, hands down. Sounds like a snake. In the Mouth of Madness is just an outstanding movie with fantastic pop culture appeal. 
And in an era when many movies were starting to experiment with uh, computer-generated images, In the Mouth of Madness uses practical effects to this winning end. The movie is surprisingly large in its scope. Uh, Like most of Carpenter's works, it's also kind of a cerebral flick with this wicked sense of humor and like razor sharp timing. You don't need to squint too much uh, to see the DNA of In the Mouth of Madness in movies like Hereditary or The Void. And while I think The Thing is entirely a better known movie, I tend to think that In the Mouth of Madness might be the most palatable for less diehard genre fans. I'm not saying you should show it to the church ladies in your family, but you probably could get this into your friend's Halloween night rotation once the kids go to bed, you know? What's the better first watch for you then? Blue Velvet, Lost Highway, or this? Ooh, wow. Um, I would never show anybody Blue Velvet to start. Um, <laughs> that's cruel and unusual. Uh, I would also never show anybody Lost Highway to start because that's just strange. Um, I think that... Especially, I mean, comparing Carpenter and Lynch is kind of unfair because they're wildly different filmmakers in many regards. Uh, But I do think that if you're going to start somebody on Carpenter's horror flicks, uh, Halloween and In the Mouth of Madness are probably the best two. I would save The Thing, actually, because The Thing has something that most Carpenter joints don't have enough of, and that's just being icky. And a budget of body horror and practical weird puppetry effects and strange alterations to the human face that only exist in your nightmares oh sure exactly and uh shout out to cronenberg we love you sir oh man david cronenberg what can we say you know uh we could easily spend the next few episodes of this show talking about how good the thing is or talking about how good carpenter movies are or what's the best carpenter movie to start people with and then how much we love the Apocalypse Trilogy. And then we could probably start a new show analyzing like his albums, his musical output. But that's not why we're here. Um, We might not be able to definitively say what Carpenter is so afraid of, but perhaps we can get into the least explored portion of his trilogy. In a word, the Apocalypse Trilogy is dealing with the transpersonal. Now, admittedly, I'm getting abstract here. And this is fully a theory here. It's it's barely based on anything outside of my own headcanon. Uh, and it's probably no better than anything other his fans have said. This also requires a little bit of explanation. So what do I mean by transpersonal? Well, the Apocalypse Trilogy is about the end of the world, or at least the end of human civilization as we know it. Very few horror films deal with exclusively existential threats, I think, by comparison. You know, if you compare slashers and other traditional monster movies, existential threat movies are fairly rare. Uh, Even fewer things deal with this idea of the transpersonal, though. Uh, That is to say, dealing with things that are outside of the limits of an individual's identity. That's the definition of the term transpersonal. So I want to break this down for just a bit and we'll we'll see where we land the thing pits a group of antarctic researchers and laborers workers against an extraterrestrial creature that can absorb or assimilate seemingly any organic life form it encounters it swallows them whole and then can nearly perfectly imitate them until it's time to strike whatever other motives an entity like this might have Its biggest issue with life on Earth is how to get that life form to drop its garb and then absorb it. The thing walking around might look like your neighbor. It might be able to imitate your neighbor's like personal behaviors, but your neighbor's identity, his personality, their very personhood, well, that's gone. It's replaced with nothing but chicanery and hunger. Now, as it turns out, very few people want to be eaten, but almost everyone is trying to hold on to their identity. Death is bad enough, right? But then the loss of agency and individuality, that's a personal apocalypse. Okay, so uh, what about Prince of Darkness? The ancient evil contained in the basement of the church 
is nearly free. The Brotherhood of Sleep attempted to conceal not only the, the entity's physical existence, but also a separate message of Christ himself warning about this entity. When it finally breaks free, this force will possess anyone in its immediate vicinity and drive them to acts of insane violence or sheer inhuman atrocity. Its goal is to unleash the ultimate in anti-creation onto the world, an anti-God. And this anti-God will overwrite the identity of scientists and homeless people in its attempts to get free. Humans are merely puppets. They're tools to be used by this entity. Here again, the desires of this anti-God necessitate your personhood and your agency to no longer exist. It's a different threat than an alien monster with an appetite and flexible morphology, sure. But our fear of the titular thing is the same as our fear of the anti-God of the church basement, right? And finally, uh, we have In the Mouth of Madness. Our Lovecraftian old ones are utterly inscrutable. They have desires and aims long predating physical consciousness. And the microscopic lifespans of our human bodies, our human identities, not really on their menu. They're not all that concerned. What we can know of them is that they have been knocking on the door of our reality for aeons, and they have finally found a way to enter the door. Sure, it took a horror writer with a good contract to pull that off. But that's way easier than massive human sacrifices a la Lovecraft. People can pay for a paperback with their credit card faster than you can say Ia Cthulhu Fatagan. But once the old ones get through the door written into existence by Sutter Kane, it's all over. The inhabitants of Hobbs End, Sutter Kane's town, have lost their identities to the whims of these old ones. They are the tools and vessels of a force too inhuman to be seen as anything but malevolent. And the finale of In the Mouth of Madness is the only one of the Apocalypse trilogy that shows the end of the world at all. The thing's ending implies that the threat of the extraterrestrial may have been contained, at least for now. And a heroic sacrifice at the end of The Prince of Darkness at least buys mankind some time from the anti-god. In the Mouth of Madness, it's not so conciliatory. In a word, mankind is fucked. It's literally all over, except for the screaming. With all that out of the way, uh, I want to get your opinions on this, Joe. Uh, what do you think the Apocalypse Trilogy is saying? Am I right, or am I missing the mark? I think the trilogy is just three different versions of the Apocalypse premise. I'm reminded of Cabin in the Woods, a film the first time I saw it. I didn't know I was watching a direct parody or all-encompassing horror movie reference, but it started with this strange company of people setting up something. Then the Evil Dead happens. Spoilers if you haven't seen The Cabin in the Woods. It's been around for a while. Go watch it. It's fun, I promise. Right, right. But the first 10 minutes of that movie is just The Evil Dead. Down to the cabin for a reason, right? What that movie becomes is an all-out slaughter fest of every scary thing you've ever heard of, seen, or thought of, not only exists, but has been contained and is being used for a reason. That when the people find out what the reason is, they still choose to say, you're not going to control me. I'm not going to be a sacrifice. If the ultimate evil is coming, I'm just going to accept that because then that's how it's supposed to be right because the end of that movie is cthulhu rises right eh, sort of yeah so that's what the apocalypse trilogy is it's three different pieces of that puzzle here's what happens when something is trying to get into your system here's what happens when something is trying to take over your body and soul like it reminds me of the screw tape letters mm -hmm. here's yeah. a concept of something that's just trying to corrupt you that's a better word. Yeah. And then the final film, here's what happens when something takes your mind, your body, 
your corruption, your temptation, as it were, and then your mind. If John Carpenter's trying to say anything with all three of these movies, it's that we are fragile. And it's going to be really hard to win. I don't think he's trying to stand on a pedestal and say, you better find God now or you're all fucked. (laughs) I think he's trying to say that if the fight was real, it's not going to be an easy win for us. We are, at the end of the day, extremely fragile and it's going to be hard for the masses to stand together. I think that's, if there is a theme, that's the theme. It's going to be hard for everybody to stand together and be positive. Ultimately, I feel like the threat will be negative. That's the theme I'm hearing. Maybe. And, you know, you've kind of hit upon something I was thinking about as I was writing this script. One of the things I had thought about at length with this episode was, is Carpenter afraid of the transpersonal experience, the experience that is way outside of your uh, body, your experience that defies the limit of your individuality or is he afraid of transmission and by that i mean if you if you look at the entirety of the apocalypse trilogy a thing keeps happening an alien virus thing gets transmitted and it absorbs your body into a hole and now you're well now you're fucked you're gonna die and it's gonna absorb everyone around it if it can okay prince of darkness the the entity that is this anti-god gets um, how do I put this delicately? Sprayed into the face of of its next victim, yeah. and now it is another vector for this anti god, this super prince of darkness. Deep, to enter. My friend, super deep. And finally, in the mouth of madness, the mere existence of Sutter Kane paperbacks seem to be pretty. I, I look, man, I've read a lot of paperbacks in my life, but none of them have literally warped my soul. You could even argue that. Carpenter is showing in this movie this vague threat of transmission, of having a thing given to you that you don't get control over. Now, maybe I just spent years of my life dealing with a global pandemic. Maybe all of us are a little sensitive to viral transmission at this point in our lives. But I think there's uh, an argument there about people being afraid of what is transmitted to you. But that does bring up another set of questions. These questions need to be posed specifically to our audience. And it starts with, what do you think? Is my theory of the Carpenterian transpersonal apocalypse correct? Is Prince of Darkness the forgotten classic of the Car- of the Carpenter canon? Am I completely in over my head here? And what's your favorite Carpenter joint? Let us know. Email us at thefrightlabpodcast at gmail.com. We can also be found on the desiccated husk of Twitter at Fright underscore lab underscore pod. Uh, And we're also on Letterbox at Fright Lab pod. One word. We're thinking about branching out uh, onto the new meta app threads. uh, And we might be launching a separate Instagram at some point in the nearest future as well. Keep your eyes peeled for that. Joe, where can our audience find what you're doing outside the lab? If you are a fan of all things heavy metal, I need you to listen to all the podcasts we are creating at DiscussMetal.com. We talk about heavy metal topics, heavy metal subjects, your favorite bands, my favorite bands. I feel like John Carpenter is something everybody loves, so we, we've done some movie things in the past, and I feel like this is going to be a great opportunity for us, not just to talk about John Carpenter's Apocalypse trilogy and how truly horrifying it is, But maybe we need to spend some time with movies, Lucas. Maybe we need to, I don't know, launch some sort of Patreon thing where we watch movies and talk about them while they're happening. Wait, we can get paid for that? Uh, We'll talk after the show. (laughs) Uh, If you enjoy all things nerdy, I've been hanging out with AJ from the Nerf Herder Council. We've been talking all things Star Trek. Those guys are always talking Indiana Jones, Star Wars, all things nerdy. They, they've got the lock on all things nerdy and fun. So check out the NHC podcast. What I want you to do right now is take out your phone. Scroll to the left. Scroll to the right. Go to whatever place you need to go to in whatever app you're listening to and, and find the spot where you can check the five stars or you can give us the thumbs up. We want to hear from you. You heard Lucas say at the Fright Lab podcast at gmail.com. And as always, my friend, Lucas, tell everyone how much we appreciate independent artists and independent media. If you love John Carpenter the way we all do, 
you grow to appreciate what an independent spirit can do for an artist. A guy like John Carpenter, undeniably doing his own thing, and he's earned the right to be a master. Now, we're not there yet. We're not masters of horror. But we do believe that there are masters of horror being born and working on work right now. So if you are making a horror podcast, you're making horror-related music, you're doing some sort of horror-related art, we want to hear about it, we want to hear it, we want to see it, and we want to give you the credit for it and get it out into the world. So you can email us at thefrightlabpodcast at gmail.com. I say it every episode, and I'm going to say it again. You want to get there fast? Go on your own. You want to get there safe? Go with your team. And we're building that team right here and right now. As always, and finally, The Fright Lab is written and researched by me, Lucas Yoakum. Mr. Joseph Wren is our co-host and intrepid producer. We appreciate each and every one of you, and we will talk to you all very soon. Someone has to have done a Carpenter cast, right? Like someone has to have done a- You a, thought that too. Someone has to have done it by now. All right. The inter- it, I still have time. The music's not over yet. Come on, Google. The John Carpenter cast. Goddamn, someone's oh, done it. Oh, f- Someone's done it before. Goddamn, that's great. What if it actually is John Carpenter? <laughs> Just glistening hot sex right, right there. Right there. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Fright Lab's <laughs> glistening hot sex edition. <laughs> Lucas is going to read. Welcome, welcome to the Fright Lab after dark. 